Welcome once again to the I Am series. We're talking about some of the great I Am statements that God mentions about himself, particularly from the book of Isaiah and specifically in Isaiah chapter 40. And this is such a God-exalting, God-honoring chapter that, wow, I mean, when's the last time you heard um, these messages uh, come out of the book of, of Isaiah being preached uh, to the um, to the congregation that you attend, or maybe to the the body of Christ at large. Well, let me tell you something. What this passage does for us is that it literally expands our knowledge of God. And it's not that God gets any bigger because God never gets bigger, right? But God actually helps us expand our knowledge about Him. Our knowledge of Him grows. And as our knowledge of who he is grows, you know what happens? Our faith in him grows. We understand how really small we are and how great he is. And we've been looking at this chapter, chapter 40, and we talked about uh, how God was great in creation, how he's just this amazing creator. In fact, he put the heavens out there for us so that we could see uh, how amazing and how wonderful he is. We secondly saw that God was great in his knowledge or in his wisdom. He says, I am great in wisdom and in knowledge. That's why we can trust him. He knows everything about us, everything about the world, past, present, future, and all the possibilities as well. And so God is this great um, person who has this incredible knowledge. Now, thirdly, uh, we want to talk about in today's uh, message today about how God is great in his sovereignty. And in fact, there's so much in this passage on God's sovereignty that we're probably going to spend two sessions just talking about his sovereignty because I want to tell you something. In my personal Christian life, outside of the love of God for me, the greatest attribute that has impacted me the most in my Christian life is the sovereignty of God. It's a topic that we don't hear talked about a lot but that we need to hear much more about because all it does is make us stronger. All it does is make us worship more. All it does is cause us to want to embrace and to fall at the feet of this amazing God. So when we talk about God's sovereignty, you know, we're talking about the fact that he is God alone, uh, that he is self-sufficient, that he's independent, that he's free, that he's self-governing, that he's a law unto himself, right? and that he does uh, whatever really pleases him. And you may be thinking, gosh, that sounds like my boss. Or, that sounds like somebody else I know, you know, on the, on the earth. Well, yeah, people try to act like their own gods by pleasing themselves, by being obsessed with taking pictures of themselves or being obsessed with just others looking at them or having themselves be elevated or exalted uh, in the eyes of other people. Listen, the more that we see... Uh, who God is, we see there's only one celebrity in this show, and it's God himself. God is the centerpiece. He is the focal point. He's the lone figure on the stage of humanity that we can really look at. All the rest of us are is simply servants to him, and we get to point others uh, to this great, incredible God. Now, what does that actually mean uh, to say that God is sovereign? Well, let's, let's begin unpacking this, uh, but let's begin uh, in, um, in uh, Isaiah, rather, uh, chapter 40, and we're going to start with verse uh, 15 here, and he says here in verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Uh, behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Now jump over to chapter uh, 40, verse 21. He says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth it is he who sits above the vault of the earth and its grasshoppers are, or excuse me, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Uh, it is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and who spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Now watch this. He it is, talking about this great God, who reduces, reduces rulers to nothing, 
who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them. And it says, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. Now, we'll stop right there because there's some more application we want to make here, but let's, let's just kind of stop for a second and unpack uh, what this incredible, these incredible truths really mean. Uh, what does it mean to say that God is sovereign? Well, here's the first thing it means. It means that God is on his throne, that God is on his throne. You know, when we read in Revelation chapter 4, right before God reveals to John the awesome, terrible, horrific judgments that are about to come upon the planet in the form of the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments in Revelation 6 through 19, you know what it does? He says to John, hey, John, come up here for a minute. I want to show you something. And John is catapulted in this <clears throat> incredible vision to heaven. And when he gets there, the Bible says he notices a throne. It's the first thing he sees when he gets there. And in fact, the word throne is mentioned 13 times in 11 verses in, uh, in chapter uh, 4 there. And this tells us something about God and his sovereignty. Well, look at how Job put it and, and how David and Isaiah in another place put it. Uh, Job said this about God's sovereignty. He says in Job 42, 2, he says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. In other words, if God sets his heart to plan something to, to come to pass, it's going to come to pass. And, you know, that really applies to the whole, uh, the whole area of, of prophecy. You know why? Because if God says that these things in Revelation and Daniel and 1 Thessalonians and, and 1 John, all these things are going to happen, then you and I can have a 100% certainty and confidence that they will happen and that they will happen exactly, precisely, and literally as God says they'll happen. Why? Well, because everything else he's already planned in the past that was prophesied that came true the first time when Christ came. It all came true literally and exactly as planned, right? And God says, I'm going to do the same thing in the last days because he gives us these prophecies. So Job reminds us that no plan of God can be thwarted. Here's another verse in Psalm 115, verse 3. This is kind of one of those verses that it's like, I want to over my mantle, you know. It says, but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Do you realize what an incredible statement that is? That if it brings pleasure to the heart of God and he plans to do it, he will simply do it. And you know one of the things that pleases God? This, this is one of these uh, hashtag mind blown, okay? It pleases God to love you. It brings pleasure to his heart to love sinners like you and me. It brings pleasure to his heart to reach out in eternity past, Ephesians 1, 4 says, and to set his heart of choice upon us. It pleased his heart, it says, to crush Christ, Isaiah tells us, to crush the Messiah so that you and I could have eternal life and we can know him. It pleased God to reveal himself in Scripture. It pleased Christ to ascend to heaven, to assume the, the right hand of the throne of God so that one day he could come back after ruling there, come back and uh, rescue his bride, and then also uh, come back to be this conquering king in Revelation 19. All these things please God. It pleases God to prepare a place for us in heaven. Listen, our God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. Here's another verse. Uh, Psalm 135, verse 6. It says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all its depths. Now, this is a very interesting point because not only do we see God working on the macro scale, you know, things he's created, the things he's doing geopolitically right now, what's going on in the world, but watch this. There are things that God is doing in the depths of the sea with creatures and with creation, with the flow of things underneath the surface that no one will ever see or perhaps even ever know. 
but it pleases him to work in those intricate ways. God is working in everywhere in the universe. He's working in places of the, of the universe that humankind has never explored, never seen before, right? But that's okay because it just gives him glory, the fact that he is working. So it pleases him to work in the depths of the sea and uh, in all of, of the universe. And then one more verse here. Uh, Psalm, excuse me, Isaiah 43 and verse 13. It says this. It says, for even from eternity, I am he. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act and who can reverse it? Well, that's a rhetorical question. If God acts, if he sets something in motion, there is no greater power than God that can stay his hand or, or say, hey, what do you think you're doing here? Uh, who do you think you are? You know, uh, only God can do that. And so we want to make sure that we give God that same kind of attention and acknowledgement to know that God, hey, if, you, if you've chosen to do something in my life, I can't, I can't reverse that. And that's why it's so silly to think that someone could lose their salvation because God acts and who can reverse it, it says. And if you want a, a great encouraging passage to read about the fact that God moves forward, not backwards, then read Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 30, and you'll see how there, there is a, a progression of our salvation that only goes forward, it doesn't go backward. It's just an amazing passage. But let's move on. Let's take this truth of God's sovereignty. And I know this sounds very uh, esoteric or may, maybe ethereal or, or maybe just lofty or whatever. Let's take it off the top shelf and let's bring it down and let's examine it for just a few minutes. When we say that God is sovereign, uh, we've already said that it, it realizes that we, he doesn't have to consult anyone before he acts. God doesn't need permission to do anything. It, simply, if it, if it pleases his character, then in his will, he does it. Uh, no one tells him what to do. Uh, he's self-existent, self-fulfilling. And he doesn't need anything. Now, once again, this is kind of one of those where we, we need to set our feet firmly here because this is kind of an earth-rocking truth here. When we say that God is sovereign, it means that he needs nothing. God doesn't need heaven. He doesn't need angels. He doesn't need a universe. And he certainly doesn't need people. So there is nothing in God that says, I'm lonely out here all by myself. I, I want to create something to play with. No, that's not God. God didn't need anything. He created us and the universe and everything that is, including the angels, because it simply pleased him to. Because he knew that by creating all this, eventually all of it would come back to glorify him. Now, we have a twisted sense of, of God in terms of the fact that he, he self-glorifies. In other words, God creates things so that they might bring glory to him. Now, for any human or any mortal or any angel, that's blasphemous because we don't deserve that glory. So think about that distinction for a second. Only God truly deserves the glory that created things and created beings can and will give to him. No person deserves the kind of adulation adoration, praise, worship that only God deserves. <clears throat> so that's why it's so inappropriate to exalt someone, a human being, I don't care who they are, to this elevated status. Now, I get it. There are celebrities. I get it. There are, you know, there are people that if you were to be walking through the airport or something and you bumped into someone hugely famous, there'd be that momentary like, tingle up your spine like, oh my gosh, I just saw so-and-so, you know, I get that. That's, that's kind of a, a little mini version of, of how to, what it feels like to worship someone, to be honest, because we're in awe of them. Now, there are levels of that respect and that awe that we can have with a ceiling that's not blasphemous and not wrong and not sinful and that kind of thing, uh, but, but we can also take that to the other side and exalt them above what they should be. But what this scripture is telling us, what these scriptures are telling us is that only God deserves that kind of attention, that kind of praise. That's why so many celebrities are so messed up in the head. You know, people, you talk about people getting an ego going to their head 
they just become bizarre in their behavior and stuff. They've got too much money, too much attention, too much adulation, too much praise, too much exposure, uh, too much media, uh, too much, you know, everything, right? And it's because humanity was never meant to have that kind of praise. All the praise was meant to go to God. So he didn't need anything. And there was a time when, quite frankly, and again, I can't even go here in my mind because my mind hits a wall. There was a time when there was no universe, no angels, and no space, no concept of spatiality. There was no time. And there's no materials. There are no physical things. Because God is timeless. He is spaceless. He is immaterial. And God is spirit, right? That's why Jesus said we must worship him in spirit and truth. So the Trinity, the triunity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit existed in eternity past without space. You say, where did they exist? There is no where. He's spaceless. He just simply was. God from eternity, he says, I, uh, from eternity, I am he. So we know the universe had a beginning. So before that, there was just Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in spirit. Now, again, I don't understand that completely. I just know it's true. And what does that cause me to do? It calls me to say, I'm going to be like Job, put my hand over my mouth and shut up for a while and just simply worship you for who you are. So in other words, God uh, doesn't need anything. And because he doesn't need anything, he doesn't owe us anything. In fact, when you read Romans chapter 9 through 11, and specifically chapter 11, verses 33, 36, you get the distinct impression that God is unsearchable. In some ways, he's unknowable, and he doesn't owe us an explanation for anything. And, you know, if you really go swimming in this sea of sovereignty, this knowledge, this, this untapped, you know, uh, depth of knowledge that, that you can't touch bottom on, if you go swimming in that, you kind of get to the point where you realize, you know, God, I don't, I don't think I deserve anything from you. I, I don't think I have a, a claim on you. I don't think that I can complain. Even the worst things happen to me, even though they may really stink and I hate it, but I, I don't really have room to complain because you're God and I am simply a creation of you. And so whatever you desire to give to me is just icing on the cake. I get to breathe your air that you created. I get to live on your planet that you created. I get to walk around in the body that you created for me or, or live in this body. But I don't really have, you know, I can't really say, hey, you owe me, God, because God owes no one anything. That is part of what a sovereignty uh, is really all about. There was a, a time when I, um, uh, I took a trip uh, to, uh, to England. And uh, when I was over in England, I, I got a little bit of a glimpse of what God's sovereignty is all about because of the fact they still have a monarch there. I mean, you was Queen Elizabeth at the time. Now it's going to be uh, King, uh, King George. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But God has no debts to pay. Uh, he's not obligated to humankind. Uh, he, no one can say to God, uh, you owe me. So the problem with that for us, I think particularly for Americans, we have this thing called the Bill of Rights, right? And thankfully so. We need rights as citizens, and we believe that certain rights are given to us not by government, but by God. They're God-given rights, and one of them is freedom and the, uh, the freedom to pursue uh, happiness in life, life, life in pursuit of happiness. But here's the deal. Uh, those freedoms are protected under the Constitution. They're outlined, these liberties that we have, uh, like freedom of speech and like... Uh, freedom of religion. So, but we love to talk about our rights. You know what I've never heard anybody talk about? I've never heard a single Christian talk about this, is that God has a bill of rights as well. Inherently, nobody gave them to him, like we have our rights, but that God has rights. We, we always want to talk about what our rights are, what we have a claim to, but no one says what God justfully deserves to be able to do and to be able to, uh, to act. So while we're demanding our rights, uh, God is really the only one who has real rights because he's God. 
He is simply, uh, we're citizens of the United States. He's a citizen of himself. He's the king of all of the universe. He possesses certain inalienable rights and to do anything that he so chooses to do because he simply is God. So maybe we should think less about our rights and start saying, God, is there anything in the Bible that tells me about your rights? But what you have the right to do, and indeed it does, the whole Bible is the story of God exercising his right to do what he pleases. And thankfully, it pleased him uh, to send Jesus for us. And we, all, we also know from Psalm 111, verses 7 and 8, that God always does what is good, what is truly fair, and what is right. Now, those three things are being grossly misconstrued uh, and redefined in our culture. Uh, what is good, what is fair, and what is right is so messed up right now. But we can always know that whatever God does will be truly good, fair, and right because it's governed by his righteousness and his holiness. So God's sovereignty means he does whatever he pleases. Let's do one more here. God's sovereignty means that he rules over all things, that all things belong to him. Now, back to my England story here. Uh, on one of my trips to England, I was riding around the English countryside with a pastor friend of mine, and we were riding down this, um, this, uh, this lane here, and there was a little river that flowed to it. I looked in the river, and over to the side were these beautiful white swans. And I said, wow, th those are amazing. And, and just a picturesque scene there was the, these historic cottages and a church, stone church over here. And then here were this, uh, these uh, swans amidst these green hills and, and castle ruins and the great landscape. And so as I saw that, I commented on the grace and the elegance of those beautiful swans when my English friend responded this way. He said, you know, by the way, the queen owns all the swans in England. And I said, wow, that's interesting. But in my mind, I thought, wait a minute, who does the queen think she is? I mean, you know, she can't do that. No person has the right to own all the swans in your country. But guess what? She does, actually, because she was the queen. And that, that position of monarchy gave her certain possessions that she alone had claim to. Well, in our country, we elect our officials. We get to tell our officials whether or not we want them to be in office. But in England and other countries that have monarchs, they simply have what they have. Well, that's really a more accurate picture of God. We don't elect God. We don't tell God what to do. God is the king. He's called the king, the king of the universe, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And so he has absolute dominion and authority over all that there is. You know, the Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the animals of the world. They belong to him. They're rightfully his. And everything else uh, along with it, including humanity, including uh, you and me. And so God has no rivals. Uh, he has no peers. He has uh, no one to challenge him. He has the power and the right to exercise his attributes in any way that he pleases. Uh, the Bible tells us he rules over heaven, over earth, and over the universe. So he's over all things. Now that, that's, I mean, that's getting us in the elevator, isn't it? And taking us up to the top floor to see things about God you can only see when you're on the top floor. When the, on the bottom floor, you just get these little breadcrumb things about God. But the more scripture elevates our minds, we understand loftier things that are true about this great God that we serve. So God's reign is not some sort of democracy, but it's a divine monarchy. Uh, and in light of this, in light of this great power and wisdom and sovereignty that we've talked about, we can see how this passage says, that's why all the nations of the world are nothing to him. I mean, it says that they're, they're a drop from a bucket in verse 15. Uh, that word drop there means the condensation that forms outside of a bucket. So next time you see a bucket or maybe a can of, of Coke or something like that, you see this, these beads of, of sweat or beads of droplets on the outside, that's what one powerful nation is to God. He just wipes them away. And then it says that, that they're regarded as speck on the scales. And this is referring uh, to when they would weigh things in the marketplace, they would have you know a certain, let's say they brought some, 
you know, some wheat or some barley and put it on the scale over here. And over here would be the weights that they would sometimes put uh, a grain or sand for a certain amount of weight on there. And it says once they wipe all that sand or grain or dust off of there, the minuscule little dust that's left over, God says, that's what the nations are like. And that's why it says over in, uh, in verse, uh, verse 24, it says that God merely blows on these nations and these rulers. And it says they just, pff, they're like fine dust uh, that, that are left over on the scales and God just blows them away. It's like they never even existed. That's how meaningless the nations of the world are in terms of relationship to God's power and his sovereignty. That's how meaningless the rulers of the world are. Hey, listen, you and I have not lived directly under the kind of tyrants that other people have lived under in history. I mean, you think about living under Pol Pot or Mao Zedong or, or uh, Adolf Hitler or Saddam Hussein or you know someone like that who's lived in history who have really come down upon their people and destroy them and murder them, that kind of thing. We've never really had that. We've got oppression. We've got unjust and ungodly and unrighteous leaders that are trying to do things that are, that are affecting our lives in, in some significant ways, but never anything like that. But God says here that those men are, are still meaningless. I mean, take Nebuchadnezzar of, of, of Babylon. Uh, where's Nebuchadnezzar today? Where, where's his legacy? He's gone. He was, he was blown off the scales. Anybody ever um, been to Assyria today, taking a vacation there and enjoyed all the benefits of Assyria? No, because they're no more. Uh, many of these great nations have been completely uh, wiped all the map, off the map. Now, why is that true? Well, be, it's simply because of uh, God's great uh, sovereignty. So sometimes an earthly ruler will uh, take his place and think he is greater than God. He acts like a God. But guess what? His time's coming. Her time is coming, whoever it might be. Just know this, that you and I do not have to be afraid of the rulers of this world because there is a ruler, capital R, that is much greater than them, that, that will come along one day unless they repent and will completely just reduce them, it says, uh, to nothing and to the point of being meaningless. At one point, they sat in the throne. They sat in the Oval Office. They ruled over. But God says one day, you will be meaningless. Your life will be as nothing before me. That's how great and how incredibly sovereign God is. A couple of quick examples and we'll close up. Uh, you remember Pharaoh, uh, whose heart was hardened after he said, okay, I'm, I'll finally let you people go. And then he, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I've sinned. I, I shouldn't let you, I, I should let you, uh, I should let you go. And then he says, hey, what, what was I thinking? You know, and he went back, chased after the Israelites. And the Bible says that God hardened his heart and, with, uh, and he gave him these 10 plagues. And, uh, and it says that in chapter nine of Romans, in verse 17, it says, God says, I raised you up, Pharaoh. You know why I raised you up? So that I could show the world what a nothing, what a zero you were compared to me. I raised you up so that my glory might be displayed through you by crushing you, that I might bring you down. So wait a minute, does, does that unfair a little bit? Maybe, so you raised up Pharaoh so you could just cut him off and show the world how great you are? Uh-huh. Maybe that sounds a little unfair. Maybe it disturbs you a little bit. That's okay. But before you start charging God with being unfair, you need to read Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 24. And that'll probably fix our minds on that whole thing. That's how sovereign God is, that he can do that if he wants to. So then there was King Ahab. You know, God told King Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16 through 22, not to go in battle against the Arameans. Don't be cocky, King Ahab. Take your instruction from me. But he challenged God's authority and went anyway, disguising himself as an ordinary soldier. And then it says a stray arrow just happened to pierce through a tiny opening in his armor. And just as God prophesied, the dogs came along and licked up his blood, uh, proving that God always has the last word. And then there was King Nebuchadnezzar. You can read about his story in Daniel chapter 2 and Jan Daniel chapter 4. Uh, he thought he was the man, right? And yet God says in that passage uh, that it, it was wrong for him to praise and exalt himself. And so God called, uh, called him 
uh, into a season of life and turned him into a, a creature, essentially. Uh, it's something that's, uh, that would, uh, seems like it's straight out of a Stephen King novel, okay? Uh, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? And God was saying, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to give you a ride. You're going to never forget. Uh, don't challenge my, my authority and my sovereignty. And then once more, uh, one more rather, there was King Herod uh, who permitted himself to be worshipped as a god. And in Acts chapter 12, it tells us that the Lord struck him with worms. Ugh, and he died. And uh, so God shares his glory with no one. So that's why we pursue humility uh, as we seek God. Now, there's many more people we could talk about. Napoleon and Hitler and Lenin, Stalin, Husseins, the Bin Ladens, all these people in the world right now. The Klaus Schwabs of the world. You know, people that think they're in charge, the King Charles of the world, all these people, guess what? They're not in charge. They're not in charge. God is sovereign. Now, I'm going to pick it up next time on what else this sovereignty can mean for our own lives. But don't these thoughts just cause you to go, okay, maybe God's not exactly who I thought he was. Maybe he's a lot bigger, a lot greater, a lot more in charge than I originally imagined. That is your God. So we'll pick it up next time and talk more about God's great, amazing sovereignty on Vintage Truth. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, hop on over to jeffkinley.com. If you haven't signed up for my weekly newsletter, get that. There's tons of things going on. Also some big, big announcements uh, that are coming really, really soon about what's going on concerning uh, where I'm going to be and how God is uh, continuing to just explode this ministry. So thank you again for watching. God bless you. I'll see you next time.